from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is uh, an exciting day for Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. And um, uh, my name is Robert Benz. I am one of the co-founders of Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, along with Ken Morris and Nettie Washington Douglass. And uh, so here, here's how we're going to do it today. Um, we have got some special guests, some very important people that you all will want to uh, know um, or at least see when they come up and say a few words to us. Um, and then uh, after they say a few words, we're going to um, have a conversation with you all to talk about our project and, and talk about what abolition means. And uh, so the name of this project is One Million Abolitionist. Anyone know what an abolitionist is? Yes. Someone who's trying to abolish slavery. That's that's one way of saying it. But you, advocating for African American rights. Okay, we'll get deeply into this in a few minutes. But uh, the the way there, there's going to be a big. Uh, uh, there's going to be a big finish to this, and you all are going to get the very first copies of the brand new bicentennial edition of the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. And it's going to be signed by the direct descendants of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. Yes. Okay, okay so uh, before we get started, we have to acknowledge the friends that we have here today. Um, and, and I've got a few to, to say hello to and to say thank you to before we get started. First of all, our friend uh, Kristen Leary, uh, she is with our, uh, our, our partner organization, the Frederick Douglass Ireland Project. Uh, Erica Cooper, thank you for being here. She came in from Ohio. She's an advisor of Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. Reggie Wills, thank you for, um, uh, from Washington Latin, thank you for bringing the students with you. Um, Dion Clark, thank you for uh, the work you've done with our organization over the past few weeks. Uh, Amy O'Neill Richard from the State Department, uh, thank you for always being supportive of our organization. Um, you know, we, we're, we're taking little steps, but we're doing the best we can to, to, to broaden those steps as we go. Um, Tara Morrison, did, did, did Tara come in from the National Park Service? No, um, but thank you, Tara. Um, uh, Colleen Shogan, uh, George Colburn, Library of Congress, did I see, uh, George, thank you. Um, Dwayne Crawford from the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, thank you for being here. Um, Max Skolnick, did, did I see Max come in? My Brother's Keepers? I may have heard a, a yeah. Um, Kate Tyrell uh, and uh, Ann Anderson from the Embassy of Ireland. It's a long drive, right, from Ireland. <laughs> That's someone dedicated. Um, Dr. Edwin Nichols, did I see Dr. Nichols come in today? I, I, I don't think I did, but uh, thank you. And um, I, I wanted to say thank you to a few people at the uh, U.S. Marshals Service. Uh, did, did any of the U.S. Marshals Service folks come in? Yes, Dave Turks, thank you for being here. Uh, anyone know who was the first African-American U.S. Marshal? Front row, front row. All right, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to give you a hint before we get started that most of the answers are Frederick Douglass today. So, <laughs> Well, um, 
I, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to give you all a special welcome, uh, or I'm not going to give you a special welcome. I'm going to have uh, Pam Jackson, uh, who is with the Library of Congress, Center for the Books, come in and, and say a few words to you. Thank you, Robert. So I don't have the pop quiz questions, so I'm the safe speaker, probably the last safe speaker for you guys this morning, <laughs> this afternoon. Thank you all for being here. I am Pam Jackson, director for the Center for the Book, and we're in the National and International Outreach Unit of the Library of Congress. And on behalf of Carla Hayden, Librarian of Congress, I welcome you here with us this afternoon. Thank you for being here. Um, so, I, you know, it's my job to just uh, share a little bit about the library and to uh, remind some of us and share newly with others of us that it's the mission of the Library of Congress that we provide a rich, enduring, diver diverse set of knowledge and experiences designed to engage, excite, and stimulate the intellectual and creative endeavors of people everywhere and anywhere. And we certainly know that Frederick Douglass is a model for that for us. So we're thrilled to be in the conversation today very thrilled to be in the conversation today and it's part of being the country's first cultural national cultural institution we value this conversation even more than that also i should mention that the center for the book has as its mission the promotion of libraries and literacy and books and reading and poetry and literature and we have that as our mission because we believe deeply in the power of words and ideas and creativity to be shared to be relished and to be used as a power and a tool for good. And now I'm speaking to the first row when I say that, that we care very much about defending democracy. And we know that being literate matters more than anything else in the power and the capacity of people to live in democratic societies and be informed and engaged. And that's what we're up to at the Center for the Book that's why we're here today in partnership with you at the Frederick Douglass Initiative, Family Initiatives and very, very glad to welcome you. We're excited for what you're going to be creating and knowing that an abolitionist is a special, special way of being in today's society with a very special and critical role that you can take on and make your own. So thank you for being here with us in this conversation to do just that. Take care. The, the place where we're doing this today, uh, you, guys, you guys know this is the Library of Congress, is the biggest library in the world, right? This is where all of the world's knowledge is stored. So that woman that just spoke is in control of almost all of the knowledge in the world. And George Colbert, he's, he's got the digital connection to the world. So that's how the Library of Congress is about to uh, they're, they're about to get their digital on and be everywhere uh, and, and put that knowledge everywhere. Now, okay, so when, when I mentioned the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, I said that I mentioned two names, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, right? Now, who knows how Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington were related? Anyone? Hands? Anyone? Yes. No. Anyone else? Okay, I'm glad you didn't answer because the answer is they're not related. <laughs> that, that was a trick question. However, they are connected and they're connected in a very special way and they're originally connected in one person. And I'm about to introduce that one person to you right now. She is the chair of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and uh, her name is Nettie Washington Douglas. Say hello to Nettie. Oh my. Good afternoon, everyone. And I have to say, Frederick Douglass still fills a room. Thank you so much for coming. I have to, how many of you thought you were gonna see him here today? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I am delighted. Thank you so very, very much for for joining us. This is a very special project, and I have my tissue because I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get through it without shedding a tear or two. Um, I suppose I'm supposed to start off by sharing with you how I happen to be related to both Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. And let me say it is truly, truly, truly an honor. It's a privilege. I don't know why it was me, but I'm happy that it is. Um, my father, Frederick Douglass III, was the great grandson of Frederick Douglass. Now you might assume that because he's the third, his father would have been Frederick Jr., but that's not the case. My grandmother told me when I asked her many years ago, why did you name him the third? And she said, well, the first one, the Frederick Douglass, had passed away, and Frederick Jr., so the third was next. So that's why he's the third, but his father is Joseph. And my father was a surgeon. Uh, he was commissioned, graduated from a Harry Medical School, and he was commissioned to Tuskegee, where the only black VA hospital during World War II was located. So he was on a dinner break. And often the doctors would choose to go walk on campus and eat dinner in the student dining hall as opposed to the hospital cafeteria. So this night, he's on his way to have dinner. And it just so happened that a young lady whose name was Nettie Hancock Washington, the granddaughter of Booker T. Washington, who was born in Tuskegee, uh, grow, grew up in California, was home for a visit. And she was literally rushing across campus, a shortcut, to go wherever she was going to meet family or friends. And as Robert so eloquently described it when he wrote Huffington Post, they collision between the two families. And they were married three months later in Booker T. Washington's home and I am the product of that union, and I'm an only child. So I have the privilege of joining the families together. But I like to say that we know that Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington were friends. I grew up, I spent my summers in Booker T. Washington's, Frederick Douglass's summer home in Highland Beach. And uh, in the living room of the cottage was always a picture of Booker T. Washington. He had given Frederick Douglass, and he had, had signed his name on there. And when Frederick Douglass passed away, the, I like to say the baton of leadership was for, passed forward to Booker T. Washington. But I recently found out, I think it might have been the last time I visited the Douglass home, that uh, we know Frederick Douglass died February the 20th, 122 years ago. But I didn't know until very recently that the day before his death, he wrote a letter to Booker T. Washington. I would like to think, and I don't know this to be a fact, but I would like to think it was the last letter he ever wrote and that it would have gone to his friend, um, Booker T. They had discussed some things. Uh, Frederick Douglass spoke at the seventh commencement address at Tuskegee. And I know they were in communication about how to expand the program at Tuskegee. So Frederick Douglass wrote a letter kind of uh, um, summarizing what they had talked about. And having no idea that generations later, they were going to be in-laws, which I just that's a personal story. I just, I just love sharing, sharing that story. So that's how the two families were joined. Um, I would like to, if I may, just take a moment. Whenever we do something, we have such support from our family. And it's not just the Douglas side of the family. Um, I would like to thank the Morris side for coming. Kenny is Kenny, Kenneth B. Morris, Jr. Um, I would like to thank the Hancock side for coming. That would be on my maternal grandmother's side. The Hancocks uh, uh, are being represented. I thank you for, for joining us. And then, of course, the Douglas family. Uh, we have Kevin and his family. Kevin and I have the same relationship to Frederick Douglas. I thank you for coming. And um, Terrence Bailey. This is, I love sharing this. Terrence is our cousin. Uh, he is truly a, a Bailey. Well, we're all Baileys, but we know Frederick Douglass changed his name. But Terrence is related to Frederick Douglass's brother, Perry. And he lives on the eastern shore of Maryland. And I often talk about I'm an only child. And Terrence says, you come on the eastern side of Maryland, you've got 200 cousins. <laughs> so I, I look forward. Thank you, Terrence, for, for joining us. And then uh, Sheila, thank you. She, she is from the Hancock side. And I've been asked to to uh, give a little story about the picture that you're looking at that's on the front of the cover. The, uh, you know, it's a standard uh, side pose of his, but it's very, very special. And before I get into that, it would not be here 
if it were not for a very, very dear friend of my mother's who invited me to come to something. She had no idea. It was a fundraiser. And ultimately, I was able to locate the picture that I couldn't find after my grandmother died. She would put it on loan to the Smithsonian. And because of Marion Jones, her daughter Cliftine is here. Thank you for coming. Cliftine wasn't feeling well, but she came anyway. Uh, I found it. And I found it in the basement of the Smithsonian. And uh, it's a long story of how it used to frighten me when I was a child. But now I love it. <laughs> he smiles at me, and, and I am honored. This picture, it looks like a photograph, but it really is not. My grandfather, Joseph, his grandson, Joseph, drew it. And it's she, uh, unframed. It's about almost two and a half feet by three feet, and that's unframed. And it hung on my grandmother's wall at her house, and it did as a child frighten me. But when I, I recovered it from the basement of the Smithsonian and took it to Marlene Morris's house and took the top off, I swear he was, you know, thank, smiling. Thank you for finding me. <laughs> and last but not least with the family, um, I have uh, two incredible daughter-in-laws. One is Kinney's. I call her our Anna of our family because she is so supportive of the work that Kinney's doing and traveling around the country as much as he does. But I have another daughter-in-law who lives in Atlanta, and unfortunately, she couldn't be with us today. But her auntie mom and uncle pop are here with us. And I thank you so much for coming, the Shermans. Uh, they live here, and they are so supportive of, of us as well. Um, the last thing I would like to say and I know my, um, Robert's probably going to, but I'd like to thank Mike Glenn um, for being so supportive. He is just, what, a couple of weeks ago at the All-Star Game, he was on the board of the National Basketball Retired Players Association, but he was elected as vice chairman. And he is a collector of rare books. He has an incredible collection of memorabilia. He has something on, on exhibit in Atlanta now. And before I even met him, he had written a book about Frederick Douglass. And so I went to him last summer when this concept came up about what we wanted to do. And, and he, was, uh, he immediately saw the importance of what we were trying to do, and he took it to his board. I want to thank him because the NBA Retired Players Association was our first sponsor where they actually gave money for books. So Mike, thank you very, very much for helping us get started. So with that, I think I am through. Uh, I thank you again so very much from the bottom of my heart that you would take time out today. I know some of you probably are taking breaks from lunch or whatever, but it means so much to us to see the support here. And, and again, on the, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for being a part of this. Thank you very much. I to keep saying in, in meetings this week how eloquently I wrote about her, but I don't recall uh, specifically about that. But if, if anyone's taking notes, it was in a blog, uh, I believe in 2011, uh, honoring uh, Women's History Month. Um, is it Women's History Month or is it Women's Month? Women's History Month. Women's History Month, yes. <laughs> I should have remembered that. Yeah, it's called Women for Women, and uh, it, it describes in more detail that collision uh, at Tuskegee between uh, Nettie's father and mother. Um, Nettie, you took you took my uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, we're talking about the One Million Abolitionist Project, right? Okay. So, again, when we say the word abolitionist, most of us think about the idea of ending slavery. How many know that there is still slavery in the world today? I know that, too, and it's true. And the next person that I'm going to introduce you to is the most important person on the issue of human trafficking in the whole world today. She works for the U.S. Department of State. Anyone ever heard of that? Yes. It's very important. They deal with a lot of affairs overseas and some of them around here too. But 
This person is in charge of all. In fact, her title has the word ambassador in it. That's, that means a lot, right? Let me introduce to you from the State Department, Susan Kopich, ambassador at large on human trafficking in the United States and abroad. Susan? I like the expectations to be a little lower when I'm going to stand up. But I do want to thank you so much for asking me to say a few words today. And I'm so thrilled at the front row that's here. This One Million Abolitionist Project is very exciting. And as a proud Georgian, I'm happy to be here with Douglas descendants, Nettie Washington Douglas and Kenneth Morris. So thank you. You inspire us, inspire us all, to build upon Frederick Douglass's extraordinary legacy to combat modern slavery today. My office has long engaged with the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and its co-founders, Ken and Robert, because we all value the importance of the past in informing what we're doing today in the present. We must understand antebellum slavery and inform what we're doing today to combat modern slavery. Human trafficking today affects more than 20 million individuals. And these are men and women, they're even children, transgender individuals, who are trapped, trapped and enslaved in factories and on farms, on fishing boats, in hotels and on the streets across our communities in the U.S. and globally. In the large conference room in my office, we have a portrait of Frederick Douglass. It's actually not as beautiful as the portrait on the front of the book, but it is our portrait. And we have it there as a reminder of the power and courage of an individual, an individual who can motivate my officers as they work to fight trafficking around the world, as they are motivated and remember that an individual, one person, can make a difference, even under the most trying circumstances. And, and before I was the ambassador, I was a prosecutor in Georgia. And I actually think that was a really important job too, especially for each trafficking victim whose case I took and whose trafficker I prosecuted. And it's important to, to pursue this through law enforcement. A police officer can make a difference. He can see a trafficking victim as a victim of crime and not someone who has committed a crime. It can also be the citizen who turns in something suspicious. It can be the person who talks to their friends at school about what modern day slavery is. All of these individuals can make a difference. Prevention is also an important part of this program so that there isn't victimization in the first place. And again here, the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives is very important because they have been educating and working through uh, awareness building in schools and now advocacy in this book. This will continue to spread the message of what historical slavery looks like and what modern day slavery looks like. Frederick Douglass himself was born on the Eastern Shore, not very far from where we are today. And he believes strongly in the power of knowledge. He said knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. And it is so fitting that his descendants are here and they want to use knowledge to educate this generation, but also those of us in the room who need a refresher course. <laughs> to read this book and to figure out how you're going to use your talents to fight causes that you feel strongly about, modern slavery being one of them. Discover your gifts and how they can be used to help in this great cause. The State Department's Anti-Trafficking Office welcomes you in this fight, and we know that you have it in you. Read this book and discuss it with your peers, your parents, anyone you can find, and talk about what you are going to do to make a difference. We look forward to seeing how this generation tackles the incredible problem of slavery through the example of Frederick Douglass. Thank you so much for having me here today, and good luck. Thank you, Ambassador. You know, if the photo in the office is not good enough, I'm guessing that for a small six-figure grant, we could license this photo to you. Um, I may be going out on the... Okay. 
So now let's talk about people who are, are already excited about the project. I want to introduce you to uh, uh, this gentleman who, uh, who is a, a friend of our organization, has been a friend uh, of our organization for a while. He, the, the, the most amazing thing I think about this, uh, uh, this friend of ours is that he went through elementary school, secondary school, and high school without ever missing a day. How about that? And he was also drafted in the first round of the NBA draft. We've got a couple of former NBA players in the house today, but this one uh, is the vice chair of the National Basketball Retired Players Association, Mike Stinger Glenn. Mike. <laughs> Thank you very much. First of all, let me say I'm very excited to be here, very honored to be here. Thank you all for inviting me, and Eddie, thanks for all those wonderful things that you said about me. Uh, and I just want to let everybody know that as the Vice Chairman of the National Basketball Retired Players Association, we are honored to be a partner with this initiative and sharing this information and knowledge with everybody throughout the country and the world. So. When I took it to our board and told them of the proposal, everybody had questions about it. They knew of the book, and our board took a vote, and it was a unanimous decision that we should support, and I should go to the book launch and anything else I could do to help further the cause. So the NBA Retired Players Association very much is in favor of everything that the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative is doing. And personally, I'd just like to say just a little bit both my parents were teachers. So, you know, usually when I tell young people that, they kind of feel sorry for me. They go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know? So I tell them, you know what you were gonna do a lot of if both your parents were teachers. A lot of what? Reading, Reading and studying, yes. And one of the earliest motivating factors my mom would always use when we had these study periods, we studied throughout the year and we even had them in the summertime. And she'd say, now, Mike, you can read a book, newspaper, magazine of your choice, but at the end of it, I want to know what lesson did you learn from what you read? So when we read something, we couldn't just read something. We had to answer to mom, well, what lesson did you learn, Mike? So I grew up having to put into words what lessons I had learned. And she gave me an example early of who her hero was, and this stayed with me throughout my life many, many years before I had a chance to meet uh, Miss Douglas. She told about the story of Frederick Douglass and she would kind of dramatize it and when he was young and he had learned that once you learn how to read, it would forever unfit you to be a slave. And she made me memorize that and say, you always remember that, how important it is for you to read books and gain knowledge and how it will impact your life. So she would keep articles when they had a stamp that came out of Frederick Douglass. She kept it, and I still have that newspaper today. And that was just so many years ago. And, uh, and I was just so proud to meet all of the Frederick Douglass uh, relatives, family, descendants, and to participate in this initiative because I knew how important it has been in my life. And also as a collector, also I'd like you to know I, I'm a collector. I collect rare books, first edition books. I have thousands of books. But my most valued book in my entire collection is that book that was published in 1845, published in the anti-slavery office of Boston, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. And then when she told me they were going to reissue it, I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. I think it's the best book. It got many reviews as being one of the best books written on an American press at that time. And in its time period, it outsold Moby Dick, the Scarlet Scarlet letter and leaves of grass and many of its contemporaries so it's a phenomenal book and i think we all should read it and reread it. it tells not only history but philosophy faith it's prophetic in many ways so i'm just glad to be affiliated with it and on behalf of the retired nba players our board and and our members even our current members because they're all going to know about it Nettie. the current players will too because we're going to make sure to bridge that gap between retired players and current players and i'm sure they would agree with me and that we are proud to be a part of this and we are thankful and we salute all of you who are here with the same feelings. Thank you very much. Thank you.
as a collector of signed first editions, Mike whispered to me earlier that this first signed first edition is now priced at $5,000. <laughs> who knows what it's going to be tomorrow? Um, <laughs> actually, we can, we can give you the price. Um, uh, just to, just uh, before we go to our, 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 next, uh, our, our next guest, the, the idea uh, that we had uh, sometime last year as we began to develop this project is that we would give this away to one million young people. With the idea, just as, as Ambassador Kopich said and as Mike just said, uh, knowledge makes a man unfit. It is not an idea that was only relevant in 1845 uh, or at any time when Frederick Douglass was alive. It's, a, it's an idea that is alive today. And knowledge, education, reading, understanding is so important, uh, not just to young people, but just to everyone. Um, uh, to preserve the freedom that we believe that we were all born uh, uh, with the right, our, our birthright. Uh, so uh, we are, we don't have the, the, I hate to say, we don't have the money to print a million copies, if in, in case anyone thought by looking at us, we did. Uh, so uh, we are going to uh, endeavor to uh, go out over the next few months and raise about four dollars per book uh, it's a beautiful hardcover copy book um, and uh, hopefully we'll get some sponsors along the way and people who are enthusiastic enough about the project to help us raise uh, four dollars per book in their communities so we can come out uh, present the book and create conversations in communities uh, that are meaningful uh, not only the young people, but uh, to, to the neighbors and everyone else uh, who, who lives and breathes in those communities. Uh, Ken and I are starting uh, in Chicago, in Atlanta, and we'll be in uh, Flint, Michigan as well in a few weeks, where uh, in case you missed the news, uh, the Flint water crisis was uh, um, created in part because of systemic racism. And this is, this is what we want to talk about and address through, uh, through discussions about this, this book. Okay, next. So, you know what, did, did I see, did Vince, Vince, did you come in? Uh, oh, oh, <laughs> this is, now this will be a favorite of yours. Um, uh, not that the others weren't, but uh, we were in a meeting uh, with our new partner on this project, the National Park Service. And uh, this guy is so energetic that I, I felt like I had to sleep as soon as, after he got done talking, I felt like, I God, I got to take a nap. Um, say hello to Ranger Vince from uh, the uh, Frederick Douglass historic site, Cedar Hill Home. Uh, are, you, are you from Cedar Hill, Vince, or are you just National Park Service? Both. Both. <laughs> Come on up and say hi to everybody. Just like to say, we are living through a golden age in the National Park Service for African American history. Two days ago, we turned the lock that opened the door to the Carter G. Woodson Home National Historic Site. Which, as we all know, without Woodson, we would not have Black History Month. A lot of us know that. How many of us in this room know that one of the other great things that Woodson did was to go through and organize Frederick Douglass's papers? He did that. And I think that shows the interconnectedness of this history. And then, as we're talking about getting ready for the bicentennial, I think we have to ask, what is the purpose of a bicentennial? Can we say that Frederick Douglass is any less important in this 199th year of his birth versus next year, as he will be in the 200th year? Or perhaps, maybe we all just like round numbers. Maybe that's what makes 200 so neat, the 100th anniversary or the 200. Maybe it's a round numbers thing. But you know what bicentennials do? They wake us up from our historical amnesia. 
because as time goes by, we forget things. We forget people. And when we have a bicentennial, it is that round number that we can hang our hat on that wakes people up. We have the choir in the audience today, but what the National Park Service is doing in partnership with the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative is to carry that legacy to a new generation of Americans, a new generation of young people, and to make it relevant. Right now in the National Park Service, one of the initiatives is called um, the Urban Agenda. And the idea is that national parks can be catalysts for civic change. Whether that is a nature park that can raise the living standards in a blighted neighborhood, a place where people can recreate, or a historical park like Frederick Douglass's Cedar Hill, where people can take pride in the most prominent resident of Anacostia. These places are inspirational, and again, they can uh, inspire that next generation. So what are we going to do about that? Well, in partnering with the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative, we're developing a new educational package, an educational package that will be actually being the National Park Service go to students nationwide. Yes, we want students to visit Cedar Hill, and we plan to have between seven and 10,000 of them visit Cedar Hill in 2018, targeting at least 200 additional school groups, one for each year of the Bicentennial, you understand. Um, <laughs> It works, you know. <laughs> but also to target students to visit Cedar Hill that lived in areas where Frederick Douglass lived and grew up, places such as on the eastern shore of Maryland, places such as uh, New York, you know, places such as, right, not only here in Washington, D.C., Baltimore City, places like that. And then through the distance learning, using media, the widespread media, where students around the world can engage, they can, they'll be able to talk to uh, Kenneth. Can I call you Kenneth Morris? Kenneth Morris, Ken, they can talk, you know, the descendant of, I mean, how cool is that? You know, to where kids can be like, yeah, I, you know what, when I was a kid, I, I talked to this descendant of Frederick Douglass, I remember that, and I went to Cedar Hill with my class, and, and I still have that book on the shelf. But ladies and gentlemen, the power of history is not just in a bunch of facts and dates and names of the past. If that's what it was, and when you talk to people and they say, I never liked history, that's the way that it was taught to them. You know, you, because you're laughing, you know it probably even happened yourself. But the power of history, because if that's all it is, is memorizing facts, then this is just a grand game of trivial pursuit. Can you recall this? But the power of history is the ability of the past to influence the present and to influence the future. And by grooming that next generation of stewards to show the relevance of what Frederick Douglass did back then, to what the National Park Service is doing today to combine that Frederick Douglass's history with that modern blight of human trafficking and have students understand that this stuff is still going on and that they will be inspired to take action as a new relevancy. It will jumpstart that cause. We have a lot of special exhibits that our curatorial division will be putting out this year, so we're excited to that to actually engage in the artifacts, the artifacts that Frederick Douglass touched and used, but also, again, to inspire that next generation through education and through civic action. And Maybe 50 years from now, how many of us will be in this room? Not, probably not a lot, but that those kids that we will be inspiring this year in 2018, they will be in this room. They will be carrying that torch on, and we will see that. So remember, the power of history is the ability to influence the present and to uh, influence the future, and it's that power that we will be harnessing in 2018. Kenneth? It's an honor to work with you. The journey has just begun, sir. Thank you. Very I'm officially ashamed about my lack of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. Man, that, that, was, uh, that was a day at church. I could, have, uh, I could have gone for another half hour of that. Ugh. Well, I wonder who's next. <laughs> no, I know who, who's next. Listen, 
This is an important conversation that we want to put ourselves in the middle of. Uh, we've been having these conversations over the last few years in our communities um, about the about perceived differences between us. Um, uh, one thing we want you all to learn when you're reading this book is that there are no differences between, the, between us. There are perceived differences between us. And the only way that we can overcome those people that are trying to make us believe that there are differences is to unite, is to, is to become one. And uh, that's what you guys have to do. That's your jobs. We'll try to. We'll do a little bit of it ourselves. But to show that unity, uh, we are so proud to have with us, uh, as part of this project, um, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. And I would like to ask Chief Perry Tarrant to come up and say a few words, please. Well, let me start by saying good afternoon. I wasn't expecting, expecting to find uh, Mr. Douglas here, but I thought his best friend who lives down the street on Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Avenue would be here. So. But, but having said that, again, my name is Perry Tarrant. Um, I'm the president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, or NOBLE for short. Uh, my executive director, uh, who, who's here locally in the uh, DC area, is here, Dwayne Crawford. And uh, here in the back. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Andre Dawson, who's a member of our organization, who's um, out of Los Angeles, who connected me to this organization or to the initiative. So you're trying to figure out what does the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives have to do with uh, the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives? I'll start off by giving you a, a history lesson. So there's two histories of policing. The first history of policing is the police service, which started in Europe. And it was founded by Sir Robert Peel and the concept there was the people are the police and the police are the people. You have the history of policing in the United States, which started off as the police were slave catchers. They hunted down runaway slaves and returned them as property. I'm not suggesting to you that we can't bridge the two and bring the two together because that's what my organization does. I've spent a lot of time in cities like Ferguson, Missouri, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and a variety of other cities where we've had a number of recent events. And the, and the goal of our organization is exactly in line with, uh, with being an, abos an abolitionist. The intent, or an evolutionist, excuse me. So the intent here with our organization really is justice by action, and that's our motto. Where the two organizations align and connect is our organization absolutely enforces constitutional law, not amongst the community, but amongst my peers. I'm the guy who calls those police chiefs and those sheriffs and ask them the hard question. I'm the guy who gets to call those police chiefs and sheriffs and say, we're coming to your town to find out what happened. That's what my organization does. We're about 3,000 strong. We've got chapters all over, the, all over the United States, as well as Canada, the UK, and the Caribbean. We leverage all of those chapters because of our depth to have those conversations. One of, the, one of our initiatives is a program we call The Law in Your Community. Every one of our chapters across the country has a representative or has access to that program. And what that program does is it's tailored for youth between the ages of 14 to 25, and it's a conversation about what your constitutional rights are. So that a lot of folks out there believe or think they know what their constitutional rights are. But we have that conversation and tell you very specifically in that contact with law enforcement what your rights are, what to expect, if it does not go well, what your redress is. And I would suggest to you that 3 o'clock in the morning on the side of the road is not the time to fight for your rights. Okay? The conversation is comply unless there is an absolute threat to your life at that moment and then follow up afterwards using the process that we describe which varies from state to state and organization to organization. In the United States, there are about 18,000 different police departments, which means there's 18,000 different ways of, of things happening out there. There's about 800,000 police officers from 
local to federal across the country. The value of our organization and other organizations that are very similarly aligned to us is to ensure that your rights as an individual are protected. And again, we're not looking at the community, we're looking at our peers and making sure that the equitable administration of justice, the 14th Amendment, is enforced coast to coast for every citizen, for every person living in, in the United States. And if you read the 14th Amendment, it doesn't say citizen, it says every person. I began my law enforcement career in the state of Arizona, which was the first state to have its own immigration law. I'm currently a chief in Seattle, Washington. The organization that I represent is predominantly made up of chiefs and sheriffs and or command level personnel, again, from coast to coast. This is a natural partnership for us. This is a natural conversation for us to have uh, uh, with the, uh, the, the Frederick Douglass fam Family Initiative. It's a natural conversation because we want the same thing, and that is we want to make sure that everybody who's in the United States has justice equally applied to them. Thank you for, for the invitation to speak before you. Thank you for being here, and we are absolutely partners. Thank you. Thank you. That, what you just heard, was very important stuff. And I want to congratulate us for putting together such an interesting program today. Uh, <laughs> the next person I, I, I want to introduce you to uh, provides the link between uh, Noble and uh, Frederick Douglass family, or uh, what are we called again? <laughs> <laughs> Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. Um, and I'm going to raise this a little bit uh, for Mr. Dawson as a, a tall man. Um, I want to introduce you uh, to the gentleman who has been um, uh, uh, extremely valuable to our organization. He's one of the top uh, minds in the anti-trafficking world today, and he does training uh, for law enforcement um, uh, officials all over the United States and he provides uh, sage uh, wisdom for Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. And he's, he's spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out how to approach this issue of human trafficking in the United States. And, um, and, and I think uh, he, he's probably got as good a take as anyone uh, in the United States. Say hello to Lieutenant Andre Dawson. Thank you. <laughs> Hello and good afternoon. It's, a, it's an absolute honor and pleasure uh, to be here. I've never had the chance or the opportunity really to tell the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives how proud I am to work with them and today will be the day to, for me to say that. I am so honored and privileged to be a part of this organization and I would like certainly to make sure I do the best I can to, to, to advance this agenda as best as I can. So thank you so much, and, and that too. <laughs> I have to share a, a personal story with you. When I got on board with the Family Douglas Family Initiatives, I heard a lot of stories about this spiritual connection between the Frederick Douglass family uh, people within the community, that there's this connection. And I, I've heard multiple stories of it. Matter of fact, I met Ken's mom for the first time during this trip, and we were sitting down having dinner, and she was sharing these, these spiritual connection stories with me. And I'm going to share one with you, and I'm also sharing this with our young people here. We went to, we went to the African American Museum on Saturday, and it was, it was raining a little bit, and Ken wanted to go visit the medallions of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. And it was raining a little bit. And one of the pictures that Ken wanted to take was him lean, uh, kneeling down with a picture, I mean, with the book of Frederick Douglass. 
and we were trying to wait for the weather to, to, to rain to stop so that Ken can do this. But when we stood there, there was a lady standing there. And Ken is to her right, and she's literally in between the two of us. And I'm looking at this lady, and we're trying to let her finish doing whatever it was that she was doing. And she stood there for several minutes. I mean, to the point where at some point when she finished, I literally asked her, was she OK? And what she said was, you know, she was looking at the words, and those words meant something to her. And to the point of this, this spiritual connection, I really wasn't sure she was ready for me to tell her who was standing to her right <laughs> after what she was going through, but I did. I said, to your right, and I was ready to, in case she collapsed or something, I was going, <laughs> to your right is the direct descendant of Frederick Douglass. And she embraced Ken, and what she said was she didn't know much about Frederick Douglass, but to my point to, to my youth here, words do matter. Appreciate the book that you were given today. Embrace the history of a great man and learn about the sacrifices that shaped the world. It will make a difference to you. Okay. The words that I'm going to share with you, some of them, if you get a chance, there's an amazing introduction uh, written to this book by Brian Stevenson. And I'm going to share a quote from Frederick Douglass who once said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Today is the beginning of one million students making their own journey of hope and success. Today is a new beginning for you. And I'm glad to be here to be a part of that. But we as responsible of adults, we have to demonstrate a moral and social obligation to be proactive and travel this journey with Frederick Douglass and help build these strong children. Today we introduce the words of Frederick Douglass that will show us all the way. Law enforcement, we won't arrest our way out of this, but we will walk this journey with you, as the chief just shared with you. I've seen what it looks like for a 10-year-old to be exploited. Six of my 33 years I spent specializing in the rescue and recovery of children who have been sexually exploited. Close to my retirement and what kept me going was after I rescued three law enforcement daughters and a high-profile athlete's daughter. It can happen to anyone, anywhere. So what I told my chief was, I have to figure out how to help in some kind of way. Because I sat in a very unique seat for those last six years I worked for the FBI and the Los Angeles Police Department, and not very many people have done that. But I traveled the world, and when I did, I was able to sit down and talk to people and try to identify what the best practices were and bring those back to Los Angeles. But today, yes. Today, the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative is making a fight for human rights deposit into the lives of these children, and you too. In closing, I, I will share this. If we as a country are going to subscribe to making America great, let's begin by supporting the Frederick Douglass Family Initi Initiatives and let's work together to educate one million children. A protected child is an educated child. And all of our children are God's children, and they are all great. Thank you very much. There's a man who looks like he could protect you, uh, and he's also got a gigantic heart. Um, we love Lieutenant Andre Dawson. Okay, so um, just, just a, you know, Andre uh, referenced the book. Uh, we, we are going to, after we have a little discussion, we're going to hand out these copies of the book to the students. 
Um, we have a couple more. We do accept bribes. The, 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 uh, the book is for the students. And, you know, people have called us and said, oh, how do I get a book? Or they, 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 they it, and frankly, we don't, we're, we're not book publishers. We don't know <laughs> necessarily how to retail the book. And we didn't create it for that. Um, if you have a desire to have a book in your hands and, and, and have one of your own, uh, there are a couple of ways uh, of going about it. Again, uh, we, we wouldn't um, reject checks and, you know, uh, cash, um, but uh, what we would really like you to do is to uh, make up your minds to go back to your communities uh, think about who might be able to help in your community. Is it, uh, you know, the, the local PTA, the local car dealership, the local bank? Uh, who is it that could um, uh, invest a few dollars to help your community bring a thousand books to it or uh, to bring 5,000 books to your community? And if you do, uh, we will come with the books uh, as an added accessory. So, um, and we'll... we'll <laughs> yeah, and we'll hand you one in person. That becomes your own. Uh, so um, that's the story about the books. We, we, we really want, uh, and again, we're flexible, but what we really want is a million books in the hands of a million young people who can uh, go out and begin to create change in our communities. Uh, so uh, now I'm going to uh, uh, introduce to you uh, my, my partner in the project uh, uh, and the partner in the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, who uh, uh, Ken and I uh, have been at this now for 10 years. I just realized it was 10 years because LinkedIn told me. Uh, <laughs> they said, congratulations, it's your 10-year anniversary. And I was waiting for someone to tell me that. I just didn't think it would be um, a computer. Um, Say hello to the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass and the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington, Kenneth B. Morris, Jr. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. This is an emotional day for the family, as you heard my mom talk about earlier. And to see all of you here supporting this work and supporting the young people that are in the front row, on behalf of the family of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, we thank you for being here. We're very humbled that you're here, and we're just excited to have a conversation with the students about this project. But before we jump into that, I just wanted to say a few words about what it's like to be a descendant of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. Wow. And as Robert introduced me, I think I heard him say I'm the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass. Is that right? Were there three greats? And the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington. And every time I tell people what my relationship is to these American heroes, not only is it a mouthful trying to spit out all those words, <laughs> but it sometimes makes me feel very far removed. And you may be sitting there having a hard time trying to imagine what my connection is to Douglas and Washington. It's like trying to picture what a billion dollars looks like with all of those zeros. Or in the case of the project, four million dollars with all of those zeros. <laughs> but I'd like to talk about my great-grandmother, Fanny Douglas who lived to be 103 years old. And she met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. And she didn't know that she was going to grow up and marry his grandson, who, by the way, is the artist on the cover of the book. But that's what happened. And my Aunt Portia, to whom I was also very close, she lived to be 95, and she was Booker T. Washington's daughter. And I remember being a little boy and sitting on my great-grandmother Fanny Douglass's lap as she would tell me what it was like to know as she would call him the man with the great big white hair. And I remember sitting on my Aunt Portia's lap, and she would tell me firsthand stories about her father. And when I was thinking about the generations and how far it seems like I'm removed, because some of you in the front row are looking at me like, wow, that's so far away. 
And one day when I was thinking about that, it hit me. Hands that touch the great Frederick Douglass and hands that touch the great Booker T. Washington also touch mine. So in a sense, even with all of those greats, I stand just one person away from history. I stand one person away from slavery. Now Robert and I have had the opportunity over the past 10 years that we've been doing this work to dialogue with tens of thousands of students. And I think sometimes most of the kids that we come into contact with think that slavery happened so long ago. And then when you look at great heroes and heroines in the history books, it's sometimes hard to imagine that they were living people that did so much. They overcame obstacles and challenges. And in the case of my ancestors and many others, they rose up to affect change in the lives of millions of people. So what I hope to do this afternoon with, with you guys is make history come alive. Because I'm going to talk about two men that were born into slavery. They were born in the most horrific conditions that a human being could be subjected to, but yet through the power of education, now, Frederick Douglass never spent one day of his life in the classroom. Can anybody tell me why he wouldn't have had a chance to get an education? There were no black schools. That's one reason there were no black schools, but I'm looking for something else. Any ideas of why, as an enslaved person, Frederick Douglass couldn't have spent any time in slavery? I mean, in the classroom. Maybe not a lot of people could read or write. Well, not a lot of people could read or write, but why do you think it was that people that were enslaved held in bondage, couldn't read or write. No one taught them. We're getting a little bit closer. Well, they were working, they were enslaved, they were, they didn't have their own humanity, they didn't own themselves. The reason that what I'm looking for is that it was illegal to teach a slave to read and write. So not only did the federal government want to keep those who were enslaved in physical bondage, but most importantly, they want to keep them in mental bondage. And this is a message that's relevant today. And as you hear about this project, as we move forward, what we want to do when we pass out a million books between now and the end of the bicentennial year in 2018, is we want young people to be inspired by Frederick Douglass's words and his examples of courage and taking action and rising up to become one of this country's greatest heroes. Frederick Douglass was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. He was born on the eastern shore of Maryland to a black woman who was enslaved and to a white man and it was presumed that his father was his master. He never had a pair of pants or shoes until he was about eight years old. He used to sleep head first in an old corn sack on cold winter nights with his feet hanging out, because that's the only way he could try and keep himself warm. He only saw his mother about four times his whole life. And that's because he had been separated from her. It was not unusual for the master to separate the children from their mothers when they were born. So his mother lived on a plantation that was 12 miles away. So in order for her to see her son, she would have to pick cotton in the fields from sunup to sundown, walk 12 miles in the middle of the night, and she would spend just a few precious moments with him until he would fall asleep. And then she would have to walk 12 miles back so she could be back on the plantation by the time the sun came up. Because if she wasn't, she was most likely going to have to face a brutal beating. So he was raised by his grandmother in the early years. And his grandmother's job on the plantation was to raise the slave children until they were old enough to begin their life in manual labor. And on this plantation, that was usually right around six years old. Now, Frederick didn't know how old he was because there were no birth certificates for slaves. He was property. Somebody else owned him. He did not own himself. So his grandmother said to him when he was around six years old, we're going to go on a long journey. And that journey was a 20-mile walk to the main plantation where she would drop him off because she had done this many times before with the other children she had raised because now he was at the age where he could begin his work, where he enters really what he called the hell of slavery. So they make that walk, they make the last mile walk, and he arrives and he kind of runs off to see where he is. And when he turns around, 
to look for his grandmother, she's gone. So here's a boy who didn't know who his father was. He'd been separated from his brothers and sisters. He only saw his mother four times. Now the only person that showed him any nurturing and love is out of his life. So he's truly alone. So what we have is a little boy who has no family, he has no home, and he has no country. But in spite of all of it, he had something happen in his life that he called divine providence in his favor. Now, I like to think that history is important for a lot of reasons. But I think history is most important because we need to know where we've come from in order to know where we're headed. And right now, do you guys realize we're making history right now? With the launch of this project and what's going to come afterwards, and you oh, are the first students that are going to be getting these books. And so what's going to happen is all the other students around the country and young people that we want to connect to are going to be looking at you for examples. So we don't, it doesn't seem like it, but we're making history right now. And I'm about to tell you a story that I want you to listen to because had this not happened, the course of history in our country may have taken a different turn or a different path. And that was Frederick was chosen from among all the slave children on the plantation to go from the eastern shore of Maryland where he was born, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, to Baltimore to be the house servant for his master's brother. Now when he got there, his slave mistress had never had slaves before. And she didn't know that it was illegal to teach him to read and write. Now listen to this. So she begins to teach young Frederick his ABCs. But when her husband finds out about it, when Frederick's master found out, he got mad. And he forbade it. And he looked at his wife, Sophia, and he looked at little Frederick, and he said, you heard it a couple times already today, you cannot teach a slave how to read and write, because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. So Frederick looked at his master, and he heard that message, and he said, hmm. If you don't want me to have this, I'm going to do everything in my power to gain it. And he understood right then that knowledge was power and education would be his pathway to freedom. Knowledge is power. Education is your pathway to freedom. That is a message that's relevant today. So he begins to teach himself to read and write. And he was very clever with the way that he would do that. Now remember, he's in the big city, so now he's around three black children. They knew how to read and write, but he's also around white children. So he trades bread for reading lessons. He picks up something off the ground and he scratches with a twig. What's your name? Ava. Ava. Can you tell me, is this how you write an A? And you say, no, Freddie D. This is how you write an A. And he would file it away. So now as he's starting to become educated, self-taught, he's starting to look around and he starts questioning his condition, and asking questions like, why am I a slave? And why do you own me? And so at the age of 20, now you're going to learn about all of the details in the narrative if you haven't already read it. So I'm going to really skip ahead in the interest of time. But at the age of 20, he would disguise himself as a sailor, carry with him forged identification papers, and he would escape slavery. He would go by train and boat to New York City, where he would marry my great-great-great-grandmother, Anna. And then along the Underground Railroad, they would make their way up to New Bedford, Massachusetts. And he would settle into New Bedford, Massachusetts. Now, here's a, a point that I'm going to tell you about taking action. Because this project is about literacy, but it's also about social service, and it's about taking action. So when he gets to New Bedford, he could have said, well, I'm in a free state now. Yes, I'm a fugitive slave, but he did. He could have said, I'm going to start a family. But he looked back and he saw that there was this legal institution of slavery that needed to be dismantled, and he got to work to do that along with the other abolitionists. So he would become an advisor to President Lincoln and a statesman and American hero. So what we want to do with this project, One Million Abolitionists, is we want this book into the hands of as many young people as possible. And my mom can tell you this, and it's been my experience that ever since I was a little boy, I remember being four or five years old, and people would come up to me, sometimes with tears in their eyes. They'd want to hug me, pinch my cheeks, <laughs> pat my hair. And it was hard to understand the emotional connection that so many had to our ancestors. 
But it was many years later, somebody came up to my mom at an event and explained why people react this way. And they always remember where they were when they read the narrative, how old they were, or what grade they were in. So it had that kind of impact on them. And what this person said to my mom is that Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington meant so much to me in my life that if I could thank them in person, I would, although some people in the government think you probably can thank you in person. <laughs> but for most of us that know Frederick Douglass is not what his spirit is with us. So he is still alive. If I could thank him in person, I would, but because I can't, you are the conduit to him. So they want to hug us and touch us. And that changed my perspective on this, so I really embrace that now. So history lives in each of us. History doesn't just live in me because I descend from somebody that made a difference, but it lives in each and every one of you and everybody here. And for those of you that have done your own family tree, I'm sure you found great heroes and sheroes. You're smiling, you did. And we want young people everywhere to think this, to, to understand and discover the same thing, that we all descend from people that made a difference. And I remember there was a young girl who was 10 years old. She raised her hand and she said, Mr. Morris, my great, great, great grandmother was born into slavery. She taught herself to read and write, and then she freed or liberated herself, and she became a businesswoman and a philanthropist. And she looked at me and she said, you know what that means? <laughs> She said, I have greatness flowing through my veins just like you do. And I said, yes, you do. You have greatness flowing through your veins too. And we heard the quote, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. My favorite Frederick Douglass quote. My favorite Booker T. Washington quote is, if you want to lift up yourself, lift up someone else. And when we get into the social service part of this project, you all are going to be working in your communities to lift up someone else, which will lift up your community, your school, and all of the young people that need hope, need inspiration, and they need to connect to these stories. How many of you guys know that Frederick Douglass is the father of the civil rights movement? He's the one that started it all. Well, there's a lot to be learned and we are excited, and I just want to give you a quick uh, story about the narrative, and then Rob, I'm going to ask Robert to come up with me, and we're going to engage you in a conversation with the time that we have left. <laughs> we're just very well, we had work to do, yeah. a lot of work to do. Yeah. So when Frederick Douglass settled in New Bedford, Massachusetts, he came into contact with the white um, abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. And he attended an anti-slavery meeting in which Garrison was speaking, and he heard that he had this fugitive slave in the audience, and he asked Douglas, will you come up and will you just tell the audience your story? Tell the audience what it was like to be enslaved. And so he writes about this later. He said, I was so nervous, and I was shaking from every limb, and my knees were knocking together. But he stood up, and what he was able to do, he had a natural gift for communication. And he was eloquent, he was charismatic, he was theatrical, he was funny. But it was the first time that the audience was hearing from somebody, really. Now, there had been other slave narratives that had been written. But it was the first time that the audience was hearing from somebody that had experienced slavery firsthand. And that's why when we talk about human trafficking, modern-day slavery today, the voices of survivor leaders are important because you're hearing from people that have suffered the injustice and the inhumanity and the brutality. So the audience is looking at him, and they're thinking, well, wait a minute. That's not what a slave looks like or sounds like. That's not what I've been told. And so he's shattering this notion in the public consciousness about African Americans being worthy of citizen citizenship and being worthy to be considered a human being. So he would travel from town to town with Garrison and tell a story, but people started to doubt that he'd ever been a slave because they couldn't wrap their minds around what they were hearing and seeing. So in order to prove that, he wrote this narrative which was published in 1845. It became an instant bestseller. Now, we published 5,000 copies, and the significance of that number is that was the original run of Frederick Douglass's narrative. Now, we understand that he sold 4,000 copies. Our 5,000 copies have already been committed and will be delivered, so maybe we've done a little bit better than Frederick Douglass. 
But that's why he wrote the narrative, because in it he made names and he made places. It became a bestseller. It made him a celebrity. It made him um, a household name. And so he would have to flee to, Europe, flee to Europe for a couple of years as a cooling off period. And while he was in Europe, some abolitionist friends of his pooled their money together and purchased his freedom for $711. And he was able to come back to the United States to become a free man and to really begin his work as a leading voice in the abolitionist movement. So that's the history behind this narrative. And we know that it has transformative properties to it. And we know that when young people, that Robert and I have given away more than 3,000 copies of another edition in the past 10 years, and we've had students and young people write us and tell us how much this book changed their lives. So we know that it will change your lives and it will inspire you to do a great thing. So with that, I'd like to ask Mr. Benz to come up and then we're going to ask you a few questions about equality and justice and other things that are of concern in our communities today. Well, before, before, I, before we do that, I want to remind everyone that Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives is a, an Atlanta-based 501c3. If you feel moved to make a donation uh, to Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives to help us with the book project, or if you go home and inspire a spouse or a family member to do so, um, we have envelopes on the back table. Envelopes on the back table to do that. Uh, in a moment, we're also going to uh, give each of you your own copy. Uh, I'd like to have Nettie come up uh, also uh, and shake your hands as we as we give away uh, a copy of the of the new book. Question for you guys: So, if you read the book and you feel very inspired. Now you're going to do something in your community to bring awareness to something that you feel strongly about. Say it's human trafficking. Any ideas? What, what could you do? Projects that you could do. Any ideas where you, you get together with your classmates, with your teacher? Who's got an idea? Yes? Um, you could try to find a way. You could try to find a way to like make sort of like a science fair, you make like a poster board or something like that and go around your community showing it out to people and sort of sort of like just showing people examples of stuff like human trafficking and how it affects people personally. Love that. So you're educating your community about what human trafficking is. Excellent. Other ideas. Anyone else got another idea? Yes. Uh, you could do what she said, except you could um, put them up instead of walking around. You could like make a bunch of them. You could like have a competition to see who would make the best one, and then make a bunch of them and put them up around your community. Excellent. It sounds like a kind of an ad campaign. You're putting up uh, posters everywhere to help people understand what we're talking about. Yes. Other ideas. Yes. Uh, um, you could create a social media account on a platform like Twitter, and you could uh, raise awareness that way. I like that. Twitter, and, good idea. And, and, and if Frederick Douglass were here today, he would probably have 10 million Twitter followers. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm going to give you the email of the ambassador today. You can send all the emails to her, too. By the way, I just want to say that I, I reject the notion that we're doing better. That, that's blasphemy. Better than Frederick Douglass? Come on. What if his blood flows through my veins. <laughs> we only aspire to do half as good as Frederick Douglass. Yes. Yeah. Other ideas? Any ideas on other service projects? Yes. It's a little bit of a big one, but you could try and go to places and see if you can find people or things that are is happening there and try and stop it. Okay, you are an activist. I can tell it's in your heart. By the way, all the, the folks up here in front have 4.0 great avenues. <laughs> about what mine was, but <laughs> do we still have many, many? So you heard Robert say that we do have envelopes in the back of the room. If you'd like to take one 
um, and mail in a donation. It is tax deductible to this project, and we would accept that, of course. Um, for those of you that are great with technology and know how to text keywords, you can text the keyword FD2018 to 71777. So you would open up a new text message. In the line where you would type the phone number, type 71777. And then in the message part, write, type in FD2018, click send, and you'll get a link where you can go and you can make a donation today and for any amount that you'd like to, and every little bit helps. So we thank you very much for that. If you do it in multiples of four, you know that you're, uh, you're buying one book for a student. Okay, can I have all of you students, maybe uh, maybe beginning with this gentleman, you can kind of uh, uh, come up. I will give you a book as you're passing by, and you can uh, say hello. And by the way, we're talking about hugging their, their feel free to hug them. Right? <laughs> uh, and if anyone feels inspired, you can hug me too. Uh, that sounds exciting. So well, these are the first start, books. Let's start with this gentleman. These are the first books. statesman of any race to speak out for women's rights and women's suffrage. 
He spoke out for the rights of immigrants. And it's because he understood what injustice felt like. And so as we take this project forward, remember that this is a project about human rights. And that we all have this history in us. And we can carry that forward with this work. So I, we ask you to take this, and, and Reggie, thank you very much. Will you stand up, Reggie, please? We've been working with Reggie for a couple of years at a number of schools. And turn around so the people can see how much you look like Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.